college will be presiding the session on class care and capital. We'll have the, each of the presenters present and then we'll hold questions until the end. There should be plenty of time to ask questions at that point. Uh, and we'll start with Gabriel Winant from Yale University. Hi everybody, uh, thanks for having me. It's really nice to be here. Thanks to the chair of the panel and the organizers of the conference. Um, my name is Gabriel Winant, and uh, my talk today is about industrial pollution in everyday life, or as I want to call it uh, in this talk, byproduct labor. The question of how people actually go about dealing with industrial effluvia raining down on them every day, and what it means for them to have to deal with this, not epidemiologically, but socially. Uh, I'm gonna look at a particular time period, which is Pittsburgh in the middle of the 20th century, to think about some of the aspects of the social history of byproduct, some of the ways of capital-intensive industrial production externalized ecological management onto the social world of the working class. And I want to think through a few things, the forms of labor created by this process of externalization and the way it fit together with the social relations of class, race, and gender. So to begin, uh, I want to walk you through the geography of Pittsburgh. Uh, the city, as you can see here, sits at the confluence of the Monongahela and Allegheny Rivers, to, uh, where they meet to form the Ohio, which is what flows up into the top left there. Uh, the shipment lanes created by these rivers are yeah. why Pittsburgh was there in the first place, despite an otherwise quite rough topography. Uh, and with coal deposits nearby and riverborne access to other materials, Pittsburgh became famously the center of American steelmaking in the 19th century. Uh, by the early 20th century, the flat riverbanks all along the Monongahela in particular uh, were covered with huge industrial complexes. The patches here obviously show you the steel mills uh, that were constructed by the end of the 19th century. And these are to scale, to give you a sense of how large they were, how much space they took up. Um, so what happens when you have huge capital-intensive smelter-based production at the bottom of the valley, right? Because the rivers are obviously the lowest topographical point. Uh, the mills put out smoke, dust, all kinds of effluvia. And the concentration of that stuff is going to obviously bear an inverse relation to altitude. Um, the higher up you get, the less of it there will be. In fact, in 1948, the mill town of Denara, which was uh, just below the edge of the map you just saw, had a weather inversion that trapped particulate from the zinc mill down in the valley, uh, keeping it from blowing away. And the, so, the resulting so-called Denora smog of 1948 killed 20 people in an afternoon and sickened thousands more. Uh, the image on the right up here is at noon on the day of the smog. Um, I also want to point your attention to the houses on the hillside uh, other than the image on the left, because this brings me to my next point, which is the way that the industrial economic geography intersected with the residential economic and racial geography. Uh, so this is a 1940 Home Ownership Loan Corporation map, one of the famous red line maps, assessing the creditworthiness of various neighborhoods. Uh, in Pittsburgh, low is generally dirty, high is generally clean. And what this means is that class and race get mapped vertically. Uh, so you'll note in this map that almost every residential area along a riverbank, but particularly along the Monongahela, which is in the sort of bottom right, is, is red. Um, and we can take a closer look at some of these neighborhoods and see this closer up. Um, oh, this is going a little crazy. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna get, get the order I'm supposed to have here. Okay, uh, so this is South Side neighborhood of Southside by Jones and Lockwood Steel. Um, and you can read in the inspector's report, it says, or you probably can't see it, but I'll read it to you. Uh, it says, level to hilly, sloping up from river, close to employment, cheap rents, very poor neighborhood, smoke and soot from mills, flood area. If we go uphill from there, uh, we see rolling slopes, slopes uh, down from Brownsville Road, crest of the hill, good bus transportation, rather desirable residential section, no detrimental influences except very hilly. We do it again. This is Rankin, sandwiched between a couple of steel mills right on the Monongahela Bank. Uh, sloping up from the river, near employment, cheap rents, old houses in poor condition, many houses have no bath, smoke and noise from industry. Up the hill, suburban atmosphere, convenient location, near employment and shopping, good elevation. Uh, I think you're catching my drift here, but uh, I, I have included in the slide a little song from the period that I want to play for you that will, I think, make it clearly we have sound. Pittsburgh, 
So what do you got for your song, Pete Seeger singing? So I think it's not insignificant that Seeger sings a song here about geography, which ends with a narrative of class formation, right? From the Allegheny to the Ohio, they're joining up with the CIO. Uh, because the industrial ecology of Pittsburgh, okay. <laughs> the industrial ecology of Pittsburgh created a working class social world around it, a vast reserve of a shared proletarian experience among the people who lived at the bottom of the hill. Uh, however, only one side of that shared hill bottom experience has been fully considered by historians, and that's the part that actually took place inside the steel mills. The way that dirt and smoke followed the workers' home, coated the workers' homes, has been almost completely overlooked except as an epidemiological question, something that happened on a minute scale and was largely insignificant at the level of everyday experience. So I want to go to what Nancy Fraser calls the hidden abode behind the hidden abode, um, and think about the way that the geographical bounds of raising class compelled working class people to live near where steel was made, well into the 60s, in many cases all the way until the 1980s when the mills closed down. And this meant that they lived in a fog of byproduct. Uh, in one 1964 study, between five and 15 tons of particulate sulfate fell on a uh, measured square mile of Pittsburgh during an average winter month. So that's between 167 and 500 kilograms of particulate sulfate on, in the square mile per day, which is, I think, nothing to sneeze at. But the study also took a sample close to a smokestack, and there they got results five times higher. That's up to 2,400 kilograms of particulate sulfate in a day in the areas near smokestacks. And this is just sulfate, which they were, you know, titrating for or whatever. Uh, steel mills also put out particulate iron, zinc, graphite. They put out coal smoke and dust. They dumped vast heaps of steaming, glowing slag on the hillsides and riverbanks. When the Easter parade went down Homestead at 8th Avenue, the thousands of footfalls would kick up enough particulate that a small dust cloud would rise over the pavement and swirl around the marcher's feet. A number of people have told me versions of this, this image. So why is this significant other than in terms of environmental health? Uh, I want to suggest that the industrial ecology determined much of the shape of unwaged domestic labor. Um, consider first laundry work in an ecology like this. There are a number of different aspects of this, right? There's the aspect of uh, steel workers' clothing. So, for example, when Steve Haverla, who worked at Homestead Works, came home from the mill, his wife Helen not only fed him, but had to rub his overalls down with grease, er, with lard, excuse me, to remove the coating of industrial grease. Every time that Joyce Henderson did her steel worker husband Ray's laundry, she had to scrub out the basin of the washing machine and chip out the accumulated dust and silt. And every wash thus involved a kind of a calculation, whether to use the machine and wear it out more quickly and have to do this extra task of maintaining it, or just scrub the clothes by hand. Then there's a question, which is represented on the slide here, of the clothesline. <laughs> Think about drying clothes outdoors in this kind of environment. Uh, Joyce Henderson recalled to me how the steel mills would release, quote, a big cloud of dark smoke that would just cover. And women who had clothes out on the line would run outside and take their clothes off the line because of all the soot and the cinders and everything that would come down and just dirty the wash up. And in fact, women in these mill towns would learn what different sirens and whistles from the mills meant in terms of emissions that they might put out so that you had some chance of actually anticipating uh, you know, by at least a few minutes when you had to get the clothesline down. And then there's the question of the maintenance of the house itself. Pittsburgh's huge pre-war housing stock shares an odd common feature, the so-called Pittsburgh toilet. Um, <laughs> this is a bathroom, often somewhat rudimentary, uh, which is installed in a basement that can be accessed directly from the outdoors. And the reason for this is that grimy steel workers could come in 
and go to the bathroom and clean off before entering the rest of the home. Uh, the Pittsburgh toilet suggests some of the ways that filth followed the workers home and made the job of cleaning much harder. There are stories abound of housewives scrubbing walls and floors constantly in homes in these towns. That I do remember growing up, said one homestead resident, how filthy it was around here. My grandmother used to sweep the front porch off three times every day. I mean, the soot on the front porch was just incredible. I mean, we were always dirty, she said. Uh, this kind of drudgery, obviously, takes up a tremendous amount of consciousness when you have to be doing it and planning it constantly. Uh, and all the more so because it actually involves a component of emotional labor. And I want to give you a couple examples of this. Uh, one example comes with the mechanism of ritualized male drinking at the end of the shift, which is an extremely durable uh, cultural form uh, for over a century in, in these communities. Obviously, it has all sorts of emotional and cultural components, why guys go to the bar when the shift ends. Uh, but it also actually has an ecological one. Uh, Lorraine Novak was the owner of a tavern in Duquesne and remembered selling boiler makers, a shot of whiskey and a beer, right, to waves of steel workers every day at each of the three shift ends. Men said the whiskey cleared their lungs and the beer softened the whiskey. Um, and Martin Connors, who worked in a coke oven in Clarendon, said, spicy foods like strong coffee, kielbasa, or whiskey are all you can taste because the dirt and the gas in the oven cause you to lose your sense of taste and smell. So men drink in working class communities like this for a number of reasons, but one of them actually is the byproduct that they're absorbing. And this compels women as part of their byproduct management labor to manage their husband's drinking. For example, uh, Martha Sloan's mother taught her how to say, give me your money in Slovak. Sloan, as a girl, was the daughter of a steel worker and a housewife who was Slovak. And learning this, she, Martha could go down to the tavern and speak in her mother's voice to her father. Uh, and she did this, quote, week after week, because that's we ha what we had to live on, and otherwise I couldn't pay the bill at the grocer's. Byproduct, in other words, could interfere with social reproduction and require extra forms of labor to keep it from doing so. And it also, and no less significantly, interfered with the cultural performances of respectability that were increasingly required of working class households in the post-war period. Uh, Mrs. R, for example, was raised by Italian immigrants who ran a grocery in a working class neighborhood. She said, I resented the fact that my mother worked and I couldn't bring children into the house. Even when I was too young to work, because uh, we dirtied the house and mother didn't have time to clean it and work at the store too. So I always felt badly about that. And what she's experiencing here as embarrassment was a real affective force in proletarian life in the post-war years. The interior registering of an external process, which was the rising hegemony of middle class tastes and values. The suburb, of course, free of the smoke of industry, symbolized this hegemony. But Mrs. R couldn't move to the suburb, she needed her family. She got married shortly after the war, and she and her husband moved into an apartment that her father owned because it was cheap. And she, while she'd always hoped to marry a white-collar worker, she instead found a husband with a job at the mill. But this was not a disappointment, she explained, because when he comes home from work, he always takes a shower right away, he cleans his fingernails, and he shaves. I didn't even think, think of him as a mill worker or anything. So what we see here is one form of security, the class and ethnic habits and traditions nourished over years of hardship, inhibiting another, which is aspirational, hypothetical, and increasingly normative, that of the white middle class. And her device for managing this contradiction is the affective labor of managing her, how her husband's body conveyed byproduct into the home or didn't. So I want to wrap up by talking about the stakes of all of this. What I want to argue is that capital-intensive, byproduct-expulsive industrial production mobilized women's labor in ways that we have not recognized. Pittsburgh, through the post-war period, had some of the lowest rates of women's labor market participation in the country. And I think this is not only because men's industrial wages were so good because it was the post-war golden era or whatever, it's also because women's work was being employed, if not recognized, quite intensively elsewhere. And this is a critical dimension of the city's post-industrial transformation that has not been understood. The way that steelmaking produced a certain form of women's labor and interpolated women as certain kinds of laboring subjects created both a set of expectations about the entitlement to women's care work and a workforce to make good on those expectations. Today, the healthcare workforce in Pittsburgh has as large an imprint in the labor market as steel once did. While we may think of doctors and nurses, obviously a huge portion of healthcare work is scrubbing, washing, and interactive emotional labor. So I'll leave you with this quotation from a 1986 home health agency as in the moment when their industry was expanding dramatically on the question of where to find more workers. Quote, the displaced homemaker is tailor-made for the homemaker home health aid position and could be said to have been in training for the position for many years. Many older women have been out of the workforce for anywhere from 10 to 25 years or have never been a part of it. 
They have brought up and cared for their children and or nursed elderly parents through illnesses while attending to the numerous duties of running a household. What's being called homemaking here was in very large part byproduct labor. The sets of skills accumulated in domestic homemaking proved applicable and useful in healthcare work. Byproduct management created a kind of pool of living labor, what I, uh, what I would call a kind of patriarchal commons, which has been since enclosed and mobilized by post-industrial capital. Thank you very much. Preggis from Binghamton. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Andy Preggis. I'm glad to see you all here. Um, welcome to Binghamton. Um, so, my, my, my project relates to um, the post-war baby boom and how we think about that from a world ecological perspective, um, but also proletarian for fertility and proletarianization in general. Um, there are, so it's part of a much larger project. This is a, I'm going to be talking a lot about proletarianization and proletarian fertility today, um, but my project um, is an attempt to connect rising um, post-war fertility, and that's, we need to complicate all that in, in, a, in a few minutes here, um, to the rising ecological surplus to which the United States had access because of its hegemonic position in the world economy after the war. Um, so, basic, so that argument is, right, you have access to cheap raw materials and inputs, um, which can fuel uh, kind of consumer products, drops the cost of labor at the same time that um, incomes are rising in correspondence with productivity, um, meaning your cost of social reproduction falls along with, of course, the increasing interventions of the state. That's the big project, right? So we're just gonna, I'm just going to talk about a little, little piece of that. Um, the first thing I want to point out, and it's it, demography and most sociology, which is the field that I'm in, I suppose, um, is very nation state based, right? We, we all know this. So when you look at demography statistics, they do it from a comparative perspective or they do it from an internal nation state perspective. And what I want to argue, first of all, is that the baby boom, which produced you know, 72 million proletarians, roughly. Not all of them were proletarians, but more or less, um, they would become proletarianized. Very few of them would be, be you know, um, you know there, there wouldn't be peasant farmers in, uh, in the United States in, uh, you know, in, in 1960, right? Or very few. Um, that these 72 million proletarians um, this was a world historic event. This was really, really important. And we can think about it from a number of different perspectives. Um, the first one is you just look at the last three presidents the United States had were all from the baby boom generation. The, the boomers not only lived through the so-called American Golden Age, um, but also the propelled the World Revolution of 1968, 72, um, the civil, part of the Civil Rights Movement, Black Panther, I mean, go on and on and on. They've lived through, et cetera. Um, now, furthermore, they were the most enfranchised generation um, in perhaps in at least U.S. history um, because the voting age was lowered to 18, the civil rights movement, et cetera. Um, and, and they were the most proletarian, meaning the, mo the generation most um, dependent on um, the circuit of capital for their social reproductive needs, so daily generation social reproductive needs. Um, so I think that's the first kind of important thing that I want to point out. Want to point out, um, and just the boom in general, right? So, okay. Um, so the boom follows the the, and we need to do this with the boom thing. Um, the boom follows um, in the U.S. when you look at fertility rates, which are a really bad metric of almost anything. Um, follow a very steady decline from about the 1880s, 1870s. Um, that does go back, but it's it's more continuous and secular from about the 1870s down to the tr the trowel, they call it, in the, in the Depression. Um, and then about to replacement, which is about 1.2.1 children per women between 15 and 44, right? Uh, that's when it goes down, and then it goes all the way back up to 3.6 um, in by 1940, by, or 1953, but it, the most of that is made up by in 46, 47. So 
the problem is, right, that they came up with all these theories called, uh, the, at the same time this was happening, demographers were talking about this thing called the demographic transition, that big decline that I just talked about. Um, so this is a problem for demographers because you, they just spent the last you know, t 20 years talking about how urbanization, rising income, and, um, and you know, secularization and things like this produce lower fertility rates. And then you have this really stark rise in, in doubling um, in some like, like so cohort levels um, in the 1940s and 50s, which they didn't expect to last as long as, as it had. Right? So this is a problem for our, the general theories of demography at, at that point. Um, so they had to come up with these kind of new ones. Um, one of them, the most popular, and this is the most dominant theory, no matter how many times it's been killed, it will always reappear is this guy named Richard Easterly. He came with this relative income model, which means basically, the, he says the boom happened because um, it's this very neoclassical kind of thing. Um, the boom happened because the people that, the, the parents of the boomers had developed low expectations for low life expectancy, or not for prosperity and things like this during the Great Depression. By the, after the war, things were so great and looked so good um, that they just had a bunch of kids. Um, that's, 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 your basic, that's your basic relative income model. Um, and the relative income refers to their expected incomes in the future that were developed in the 30s and their actual and rising incomes that were in the 40s and 50s and 60s. Yeah. Um, then there's these, this one fails for some other reason I'll talk about in a second. Um, then there's cultural theories. So there was this big post-war consensus that um, the reproductive consensus, as May calls it, um, coming out of the, world, the, the vicissitudes of the Great Depression, World War II, and then the scariness of the bomb and the Cold War, and the Cold War that made people run into the 